martial art fighter versus ancient combat sports practitioner. Here's a question that will be interesting to many of you. The Ultimate Fighting Championship and Mixed Martial Arts have become huge in the past couple of decades. We now have a sport where fighters can strike and grapple in order to knock out choke out, uh, make the opponent tap out, or win by decision. A lot like in boxing with judges. Brazilian ground fighters changed the martial art landscape beginning in the 1990s. Traditional martial arts reigned, and because of mixed martial arts, some new ideas came in, such as the idea of ground fighting, you know, really and submissions on the ground. But also, uh, wrestling became sort of one of the most important martial arts. Um, Alongside Muay Thai, kicking arts, boxing, you know, that sort of thing. The thing that makes up the uh, MMA practitioner's uh, tool belt. Um, It's only later, after strikers become proficient at avoiding being taken down, by uh, wrestlers and Brazilian jiu-jitsu practitioners and just, you know, any M- MMA fighter should be able to take someone down and submit them on the ground, theoretically. Um, it is, you know, it's only until, I guess you could say recently, I don't know, not recently, but it's only until a little later after, you know, the ground fighters were dominant. And they still, of course, are. You have to be able to do it. But but now we actually have people who can win. We actually have champions now who can win, who can win standing on their feet, you know. Check out footage on YouTube. You know, grab some popcorn. Spend 20 minutes, or, you know, you can spend all day doing this. Watch footage from people like Steve Wonderboy Thompson. Or uh, Conor McGregor, of course, is a big name right now. In the Ultimate Fighting Championship, the UFC. So, the mixed martial arts world, the modern mixed martial art world, continues to change, and it incorporates techniques previously thought to be inferior uh, techniques associated with perhaps traditional martial arts schools. Uh, But make no mistake, there are many aspects of a multitude of traditional martial arts, uh, arts which fail to find a use in combat sport. And that's okay. We look forward to uh, seeing what practitioners can bring to the table. But it's also good, you know, in the modern age to show how some techniques really don't work. But again, all these great techniques in the MMA, uh, most of them did actually exist with traditional martial arts. It's just now there are certain select techniques, just, you know, maybe a handful that are considered legitimate techniques now from the traditional martial art world. But, But also keep in mind... Traditional martial arts can be really broad, and some martial arts had certain functions. I mean, some are really just based around a specific weapon. And even if they do have unarmed combat, it imitates what they do with their weapon. So it's, you know, it's, 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 you really got to look at each traditional martial art, you know, in turn. Um, Aikido is a big one that people talk about. And they say, Aikido, yeah, it's really beautiful and. You know, you throw people around, you use wrist locks, and you use clothesline-like techniques. Uh, Yet a lot of mixed martial artists say, hey, this is a real uh, example of a traditional martial art that has no effect if it's just kind of there to be flowery, and you're just really kind of developing an abstract skill, uh, is what many martial artists, mixed martial artists, uh, say about Aikido. And when compared to mixed martial arts, well, they're right, of course. You begin doing only Aikido movements in mixed martial arts environment, well, you're really uh, out of your element. Or if you succeed, then you're innovating things. You're finding places to use it. Or um, your understanding of it is different in its application, you know. So, but, but with all that said, 
right now, I mean, since the 90s and right now, it's really exciting to be a sports combat enthusiast. Uh, with the UFC and, you know, all the other smaller ones that kind of uh, appear and are often swallowed by the UFC organization, uh, the mixed martial art world is it's just really exciting right now. You actually have, it's been around long enough that people kind of know what works, what doesn't work, but we also have champions that show up that are doing all, you know, with great athleticism and, um, and that sort of thing. And um, it just keeps growing and maturing and becoming a different beast altogether. So it's great to watch it over time, uh, not just the individual fights, you know, where you um, somehow stimulate a gland because of the stimulation of the violence that you see in front of you. You know, everybody knows that story. Okay, so here's the big question. Here's the big question for a classicist like myself who's thinking about this topic. Here we go. How would an ancient combat sportsman stack up against a modern mixed martial art practitioner? I'll talk about that a little bit, and uh, maybe in the future I'll be talking um, more about the same topic, but I'll definitely have episodes where I'm talking more about athleticism in the ancient world, war, fighting, body movement paradigms even, sports, and... Um, that sort of thing. Um, but definitely leave comments below if you have any ideas. And uh, if there's anything I left out um, that you can think of, that'd be awesome. Okay, so really all I want to do is I want to talk about, you know, what makes a modern MMA fighter? What systems are we looking at? And I want to compare that to systems in the ancient Greek world. Uh, movement systems from the modern MMA world and systems from the ancient Greek world. And this is, keep in mind, this is combat sports. I'm not talking about combat in general, like weapon combat. I'm talking about unarmed, rule-regulated, usually a weight class. You know, there are certain things you can do, certain things you can't do. So like boxing, well, of course there are certain restrictions, So because choking and boxing would take away from the fine art of fisticuffs. Okay, so here we go. What does it take for a well-rounded MMA fighter to succeed? Or what do they say that at least a fighter should have a base in? Some fighters, of course, you know, exceed at certain things, like wrestling and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, or one is better at boxing, you know. But let's really look at the systems, and then we'll look at the ancient systems of body movement. Okay, so this is pretty cool stuff, but I won't linger on it too long because there's a lot of stuff to cover. Hey, feel free to, like, write some of these down and start your own list. And um, find stuff that I left out and, and leave it in the comment section, you know, especially if this interests you, of course, you know. So the well-rounded MMA fighter, what skills do they have? What systems? Boxing, okay? Boxing is a highly, highly developed Western art. Um, it, inside of boxing exists many bo mentalities on how to box, especially in different eras. Like if you read a book um, by a champion you know, back in the 50s, then um, you might actually compare it to footage of Mike Tyson training with his trainer, you know, in the 80s and and um, see that they're actually quite different. They're actually distributing their weight differently when they strike oftentimes, you know. Um, there are certain techniques some, you know, really base their movement on and others not so much. Now, MMA fighter needs some sort of boxing skill, although some of them do what's more like heavy hands is what they call it. It's more like heavy hands where they're not using sort of um, feeler jab into cross, into uppercut with good timing, you know, good combinations. Heavy hands has more to do with, you know, if the strikes land, then they will probably really disturb the person who's being struck by it. And sometimes heavy hands can also sort of displace a, a large amount of weight, even if, say, um, the opponent does sort of block or guard against the strike, but still there's a lot of weight moving into their body, so it, it's difficult for them to, say, move forward for a beat or two, you know, and then the heavy hands person can just land the opposite arm, you know. So you can imagine how that would, just, that would work. Then we also have, uh, after boxing, we have what I would categorize as kicking systems. So we're talking about kickboxing, of course. 
Uh, Muay Thai, of course, a lot of Muay Thai and mixed martial arts. Um, it's considered very Muay Thai is considered one of the most legitimate kicking arts when it comes to mixed martial arts. But kickboxing in general is um, still pretty strong. Taekwondo fairly strong. Traditional karate um, exists with some fighters, um, you know, and tournament style fighting. I would distinguish from say like karate tournaments are different than traditional karate. You know, it's like traditional kicking fighting is um, usually has a stronger base, not as not as much hopping around, um, a lot of kicking with their power kicks with the rear leg and power strikes uh, while rooted firmly into the ground. Whereas tournament style kicking, you see a lot more kicking with the lead leg, the front leg. Um, some really effective stuff there. It kind of evolved about a, out of point fighting and early karate tournament style like Bill Wallace, Bill Superfoot Wallace. You see it a lot with Steve Wonderboy Thompson as well. Very effective front leg. And that's a highly developed skill. Um, not a lot of mixed martial artists have that. If they did, they would probably use it more, of course. So it's actually a highly developed skill that uh, Steve Wonderboy Thompson developed um, while fighting in a completely different, you know, in kickboxing and that sort of thing. And it's like um, some of these MMA fighters are just becoming, were highly specialized, so they're better at a certain thing than anyone else, so they dominate using it. So Steve Thompson is very dominant uh, with kicking. He even has like a side stance he does, which is really unorthodox for MMA, not unorthodox for tournament fighting. And then you have people like uh, uh, Ronda Rousey, who is just, you know, a brilliant Olympic champion of judo. And she pulls off these great judo moves that uh, a lot of people have never seen even. I mean, she can do basic judo like that people have seen, at least popular, you know, judo, you might say. And then also more obscure. She can grab onto somebody, fall in any direction, crank in any direction, lift in any direction, and she can pull a move out you know she actually has a technique for that she knows how to take someone down anyway so there's boxing kicking systems and then we have wrestling systems i mentioned wrestling earlier like wrestling um and traditional martial martial arts prior to the ufc prior to the emergence of popular mixed martial arts were like oil and water Traditional martial arts and wrestling were two completely different things. Um, the tournament martial artists, you know, they might have been a wrestler when they grew up, but it doesn't do them any good in tournaments or uh, in the actual school because as, as soon as people grapple or they fall on the ground or they are wrestling each other on the ground, then they're told to stop and stand back up and restart. So the traditional martial art world, you know, in, in terms of actual tournaments you just didn't go to the ground it was an accident that you went to the ground or what have you unless it's judo of course or wrestling but wrestling uh, maybe also sambo this the russian sambo would work in this category but wrestling you've got to have it as a mixed martial art fighter so wrestling has all almost everything to do about controlling and taking down um, the opponent with grappling so wrestling is you're kind of like controlling and moving with the opponent on the ground. So if you grow up wrestling, that's a big asset for you as a mixed martial artist. It really is. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, wrestlers tend to be the best at taking people down. So in the mixed martial arts. So that's a big asset to have. Um, at least if you're not a good wrestler and you're a mixed martial artist, then you're actually practicing wrestling and at least to the extent that you're avoiding being taken down so you take wrestling seriously even if you're not very good at it uh, in modern mixed martial arts of course and then we have to look at another system which is not wrestling but is often confused with it and that is a submission system okay now a submission system there are many submission systems but in the mixed martial arts we're mainly talking about brazilian jiu-jitsu um of course you have submission in you know traditional japanese jiu-jitsu from where the name comes jiu-jitsu japanese uh, and judo of course um 
but they're not mainstays. Whereas in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, you know, they come up from Brazil and they're like, Hey, this will win the fight against somebody who is a striker. You get in, you take them down. Once they're on the ground, you wrap them up, you incapacitate them and you submit them by the end. And, um, you know, there are two main submissive moves. There are two main submission moves. And those are actually traditional moves, like I said before, from Japanese jiu-jitsu and existed in judo. And that is the two... Anyone know? Can you guess before I say them? The two main submission moves on the ground. Um, if there are others that you feel like should be included, like there should be three main ones or four main ones, then, you know, leave that in the comment section. I'd be glad to take in new information and change my mind any time about this. Uh, it's not my specialty, of course. Um, but the two main moves in submission systems on the ground are the rear naked choke, okay? That's when your chest is on your opponent's back, you have your legs wrapped around their legs and hips, and you have one arm choking around, going around their neck, choking them, and the other, and the hands are together, generally. Um, and you're squeezing and choking the person out until they pass out, or if they tap out. So the tap out just makes the ref, you know, pull your arm off the opponent so the opponent doesn't fall asleep. Um, and then the second main move is the um, one arm scissor lock. Um, um, it's where, and this is, you know, Ronda Rousey's signature move, I guess. Um, this is where you have the opponent's arm outstretched and you basically have their arm between your legs. You're both facing up, right? And you're grabbing the person's wrist or hand or arm or whatever. And you're straightening their elbow against your, like, hip, your pelvic region. So you're thrusting your hips forward, squeezing your butt muscles, right? So your hips come forward. And cranking back on the wrist. So you're actually basically going to break their elbow if they don't tap out, you know. Uh, or wiggle out, you know, get out. Um, those are the two main submission moves. And, of course, those did exist with Japanese jujitsu, And that's, you know, with the Japanese grappling arts, those are really, you know... That's the really the only place you, you would see it. You would see other arts adopted, of course. Um, <clears throat> but you really, with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, you have the Japanese, you know, to thank. Without Japanese Jiu-Jitsu, there is no Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. There is just really isn't. Um, because Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, yeah, you're dominant on the ground, but what do you have if you don't have your two main submissions? You have other submissions, of course. I mean, you can guillotine someone, though. You know what I mean? There's a, all sorts of stuff, actually, you know, leg holds, you know, all sorts of stuff that you can do to submit someone. But, you know, those are the two main ones. But with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, you know, a lot of those really are, you know, Japanese, and that's where they learned it. So, I mean, you know, you have to give homage to that, uh, to that lineage. So those are your, we have boxing, kicking, wrestling, and submission systems. And then I want to talk about some specific systems that kind of fit certain categories, but kind of not. I want to address Muay Thai again. Muay Thai is special. There's some unique features to it. And it has to do with, it's, it's actually considered a traditional martial art, but it actually existed as a living combat sport art, you know, like in Thailand and areas such as that. You know, you have Muay Thai fighters. And what they do, they do something really special. <laughs> Um, I don't know if I should call it special, but they do it. No, literally, it's special. Um, it stands out. Is the way they kick and the way they strike, and they also use elbows and headbutts. Unlike, say, traditional boxing and kickboxing, they they really their number of strikes is much greater. You know, they actually open those rules up. Whereas a lot of other people in at least sports combat before the UFC, they did not have those open rules to do that sort of thing where you use knees. These are so devastating in combat. They're very, very devastating. And, of course, they were rightfully, you know, outlawed in certain, you know, arts that wanted to focus on just the foot, just kicking. So, anyway, Muay Thai, they have some great foot sweeps. They just have some amazing stuff that that works well in MMA. Spinning elbows, you know, strange angled elbows, flying knees. You know, they were doing that stuff long ago, and this stuff works in MMA. It really works. Also, stuff like um, 
this is hard for me to articulate. I don't know if I quite understand it myself. You see this in regular Western boxing as well, of course, but and you only usually see it in combat sports. Like they don't teach it in traditional combat arts, and you don't see it in, in a lot of like karate and taekwondo. But what this is is it's like when you it's like a special form. It's a way of punching and kicking where you use kind of the weight of your bones. You're not just using your big strong muscles to do all your power. But you're kind of like, um, it's more like swinging a weapon. It's more like swinging a big piece of meat with a bone in it, you know? You know what I'm saying? It's not just muscle going wham, like a whip. It's more like someone lifting up and then crashing down. And so you see this in Muay Thai, but you also see it in MMA. And it's really effective because you don't want to constantly use up all your muscle explosive strength. Look, you're going to get fatigued in two minutes if you're using, you know, your most powerful, explosive, linear striking, okay? Or at least that's what fighters tend to do, <laughs> fatigue. So Muay Thai is great because you're you're kind of learning to fling your bone weight. And you see this with the uh, low round kick to the thigh. You actually see, and you don't always see it, but you see when you learn Muay Thai, you're often striking like downward with a low kick, which is kind of weird for tra- for the low kick in traditional martial arts when you do the low round round kick you're kind of coming straight up from the ground and you're you're lifting the knee a little bit but it's more like parallel you're not trying to almost like look like in Muay Thai like you're kicking downward and they do this with head kicks as well they they kind of press in press their knee down and press forward with it it almost becomes like a linear strike it's hard to describe in audio but Muay basically the idea is that Muay Thai has some unique features that that really influence how mixed martial arts develops. Okay, and so the other art I want to talk about is judo. Judo is really interesting. Um, Like we talked about Ronda Rousey coming in and doing judo. Well, she had already been good at this. You know, remember the two submissions, you know, that are important? She was already a champion using one of those submissions and was really good at using the other, the rear naked, naked choke, Hatakajime. And, you know, because judo is a Japanese system, and they have those techniques in them, and she was already good at it, so that translated super, super well to MMA. But it's hard to get that good at it. You know, she had to work really hard to get good at striking to kind of catch up. Um, but judo is kind of a special system, and in many ways, it's on the fringe, and people don't actually. A lot of MMA fighters don't go out of their way to practice judo. Um, but it is, so that's why I mention it separate, but I mentioned Muay, Muay Thai separate for different reasons because of its unique features and influence in MMA. Um, and of course, you know, I mentioned Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. That's the primary, you know, thing that allowed MMA to happen, you know? Um, so there are two more things I want to talk about. I've done boxing, kicking, wrestling, submission, and then I talk about Muay Thai and Judo, but I want to talk about athleticism, modern athleticism. You know, this is what makes the difference between um, local and, uh, like, what I see at least in in some of the cases is, like, when mixed martial arts first started in the local scene, you had very few athletic fighters. I mean, really athletic, like, college-level level athletic. You know, they were just kind of martial artists or boxers or whatever, And they didn't have that raw athleticism of a college-trained athlete, you know. Um, Let me tell you, there's a big difference. You know, the training you get doing um, squats and deadlifts and uh, scientific explosive strength training in the modern age and for professional athletes, you know, pro athletes who get paid big dollar, but also college level. I mean, colleges are really great at hiring the right people and absorbing the... um, most useful information because well they do want their teams to win um and the coaches do as well and they hire strength and conditioning coaches just to do this but modern athleticism is through the roof um and i have to mention that and it's it's a big difference if you don't have the athleticism um and you have only technique man you're just not going to do as well unless you're real special of course or you're in the right weight class where you can dominate everyone athleticism really stands out i don't want to go on it too long maybe i'll you know I don't know. I don't want to go on about it too long. But there is a difference. We talk about Olympic lifting, and I mentioned a lot of the primary movements. And, um, you know, there are just some scientific theory. You know, like, for example, working within 70% of your maximum lift. 
I mean, that's an important principle that if you don't know it, then you might not use it, you know, um, and it's in a scientific principle, you know, if you want to gain consistently, gain superior elite strength, you've got to figure out your, basically your one or two rep max, you know, preferably your one rep max, unless you have some weird injuries, and you want to make sure you work within 70% of your one rep max, and then, of course, recheck your one rep max after a, you know, a cycle, um, so yeah, modern athleticism really stands out and I'll compare it to ancient athleticism. And then the last thing I want to talk about for the modern MMA fighter is chemical enhancement supplements, our knowledge of, you know, um, what we need to consume and how much we need to rest. Um, but also steroids, of course, uh, steroids are of course very, very important to bring up. If you're going to make this comparison between the modern fighter and the ancient fighter, are the modern and ancient athlete. You have to put in steroids. Steroids make a difference. Um, they can shorten your career, but they can also give you a career to have. <laughs> I don't do steroids. I don't, you know. Um, there's just, you hear it in the news. You hear actual professional athletes. You know, I don't know any professional athletes, but in that world, in the professional athletics world, steroids is a big deal because people are getting big paychecks and they want to win and they know that gives them the advantage. You see that in so many cases. So, you know, if you're listening to this podcast, <clears throat> you've already heard the steroid issue, whether it's bicycling or baseball or mixed martial arts, football, what have you. It's a big issue and it can give you an advantage. Okay, so there we go. That's some things I wanted to talk about. Issues associated with a well-rounded MMA fighter. Modern MMA fighter. And let's compare that to the ancient uh, Greek combat sports competitor. Okay? So, in the ancient world, um, we do have boxing. Um, we have, you know, several boxing styles at least. Because, you know, some boxing in different eras. And, this, of course, is a long stretch of time we're talking about where we have references to people boxing. Um, but you have those who will wrap the hands and do boxing. But we also have those who will wrap the hands and um, put spiky things on their glove wrap. So we have sort of brutal, inhumane, uh, yeah, more inhumane styles of boxing than modern boxing. We have a whole range of boxing, possibly what would you consider more humane boxing. Uh, of course, in the classical era in certain parts, you know. Um, so when it comes to boxing, uh, we know there was more brutality in some boxing. But, um, you know, we know from depictions and that sort of thing that it was perhaps in many ways very comparable um, to Western boxing. And of course, when I say Western boxing, I don't mean just now, but I mean, you know, gosh, 19th century they were doing boxing, you know, and and before. So... Um, we have what I would call many different styles of boxing, theories of boxing, you know, and, um, because boxing existed so long in ancient Greece, you know, you can almost assume the same thing. They had a wide variety of styles at any one time. So the only thing we really don't know that we'd like to know is how, how does their elite boxer compare to our modern elite boxer, you know? I got the impression that our elite boxer would have an edge um, for, you know, scientific reasons, perhaps. Um, but you never know. Sometimes it has to do with the boxer. <laughs> there might be an ancient boxer that just, you know, is just so dominant that uh, it's hard to get anyone in the modern world. You know, it depends on the person sometimes. Okay, so let's move on. There are boxing styles somewhat comparable. Like when you look at ancient pottery, you know, and that sort of thing. You see people boxing with their hands wrapped. You just don't know how, you know, if they're using the same technique or if they're just kind of moving forward and back and hitting each other. You know, we don't have much of a reference. But I tell you something really cool. There is a reference to someone um, talking about how they became so good because they learned not to go right at it at the beginning they learn to avoid the opponent and they get tired and then that's when you go in and start actually trying to punch them <laughs> you know i mean so that that's actually ancient strategy right there and that's modern strategy as well i mean you'll hear coaches say hey you know just feel them out in the first round if you can go you know they'll give advice like hey if you can go for the knockout you know that's great but don't 
waste your energy. Throw a good combination and then back out. Throw a good combination back out. Double jab, double jab, you know. Um, and it's only in, until you've conserved your energy and the other person has wore himself out or herself out uh, that you can really unload, you know. Because really, if um, you have two equal opponents and you're just standing in the same place and you're just kind of trading punches, it's pretty easy to avoid or block an oncoming punch that you see when you have good energy. It's much more difficult when you are highly fatigued and your defense is not as good. You know, it's just uh, pretty obvious, I guess. Okay, so there's boxing. And now the second is wrestling. And boxing and wrestling are both very comparable to modern boxing and wrestling, I think. In many ways, it's comparable. It doesn't mean that they're equal or one's better than the other, but it means that you can... There are a lot of points of comparison is what that means. So wrestling kind of like modern wrestling is ancient wrestling i mean it had evolved from it you know at least like when we talk about wrestling we talk about roman greco wrestling don't we you know <laughs> that's a style of roman greco wrestling right there it says it right there in the name um but um but then we also have styles of wrestling we do not call roman greco wrestling but when you see depictions on ancient pottery and frescoes and that sort of thing you see Basically what you see in modern, you see one person taking the other person's back, you know, holding their elbow, you know, a lot of times like wrestlers do, they kind of hold at that little elbow joint, you know, it's a good place to hold on the body. You know, the ancient Greeks, they would oil themselves up, so they really needed to, you know, learn good hand positions and that sort of thing, arm positions on the opponents so they don't slip off. So, and you have that in modern wrestling, right? You have that little knob on the elbow people talk, you know, coaches talk about grabbing on to for certain moves and that sort of thing you know and you know you just look at go on google and look up um pottery ancient pottery uh wrestling you know and look at the images of all the wrestling techniques and moves you know and if you you are accustomed to seeing wrestlers you will see all those positions that they're in tangling themselves up and it looks like college wrestling you know it doesn't look like pro wrestling you know it doesn't. They're not picking each other up and throwing each other. They're not getting each other in clotheslines. You know, um, they're doing full body like wrestling type stuff where they're trying to pin each other. You know, and that sort of thing. So very, very similar. You know, so in other words, just right there. Think about this. You have the MMA fighter who is beating everyone because they're good at wrestling. Well, guess what? The Greek can wrestle too. Or you have someone in mixed martial arts who dominates with boxing. They just have a couple of tricks up their sleeve, and they've been doing it so long, they can trick everybody and beat them. And they have good timing, good speed. You know, they know where to hit. They know to hit the jaw, not, you know, the eyebrow. You know, focus on the jaw. Hitting the eyebrow is awesome. It makes the eyebrow bleed and gets blood in their eyes. But maybe they know to go for the knockout. Sometimes it's just what you know. Um... So boxing and wrestling, just right there, very comparable. So if you get somebody that, you know, wrestled and boxed, maybe they're probably better at one than the other, you know. Someone in the ancient world against someone of the same in the modern world. Go at it, you know. Gosh, it wouldn't take long for the ancient person to figure out how to ground and pound, you know, and then how to cover themselves from being, you know, ground and pounded themselves. You know, there are some things you would need to learn. They would definitely need to ta start taking classes in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu <laughs> to figure out good ground position. But if they already have wrestling, then gosh, they're already miles ahead of the game than someone in the modern world who doesn't. You know, if you look about the situation that traditional martial arts were in, they, when it comes to uh, the UFC, they didn't have wrestling usually. They didn't have Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu they didn't have, you know, uh, you know, a lot of people knew the submissions, but they only used them as, like, self-defense move. They didn't spar with them. They would just kind of, you know, when you go to a traditional martial arts school and you learn self-defense, it's often, like, step one, step two, step three type stuff. It's not actual sparring. It's like, okay, grab the wrist, step back. Okay, now take the wrist and then twist it like this. 
and the person's not really resisting and they're like, oh, you got me in a wrist lock. Cool. You know? So a lot of times, you know, certain moves that wouldn't work in MMA can exist in traditional martial arts because that's how they're taught. They're not taught in a sparring-like format. They're just taught as self-defense techniques. So they, you know, so they they seem to hold more legitimacy than maybe what they really do uh, when it comes to actually using it in real-life self-defense. Of course, I guess that's obvious nowadays <laughs> with uh, if you have any exposure to mixed martial arts. Okay, so we have boxing, we have wrestling. Those are two great comparisons just right away. We had boxing and wrestling in the ancient Greek world, at least to an extent. And... Um, there are also unmentioned combat styles. You know, our glimpse of the ancient world is only through the eyes of the archaeology we have and the text that is preserved. And that's very, very limited. I mean, the text we have, there's a lot of text that we have from the ancient world and a lot of knowledge of archaeology, but it's still very, very limited in terms of knowing really what was going on at all times in every place, you know. So we have to have a category for unmentioned combat styles. You know, maybe a Greek youth in certain areas did grow up learning different flips and kicks, and they would have been good at kicking. Maybe, say, you know, Spartan kids or something were really good at, like, jumping up for trees and flipping and kicking and doing cartwheel kicks. It looked like capoeira or something, and it just was never mentioned. It was just part of their training, and it wasn't something that other Greeks really necessarily knew about because it wouldn't be something that would you would use in war. It would just be something you would use to keep in shape and show off and spar and play around, you know? And maybe only the young boys did it, <laughs> you know? So we have to have a category for unmentioned combat styles. Um, there could have been anything. There could have, we could have seen, you know, great submissions. We could have seen spinning back fists in the ancient world. We could have seen spinning heel kicks, flying knees. We just don't have record of it. You know, a, a war-based society like that, you know, compare it to other cultures. Um, gosh, I'd like to think that they did actually have head kicks, and they did have flying knees, and, you know, and they did have elbow strikes. You know, I think it likely that they, or at least in some areas, at some places, at some times, that they did have the diversity of the modern mixed martial artists, you know, the, the techniques I've mentioned. Okay, so we have boxing, wrestling, unmentioned combat styles. Now let's talk about athleticism. The athleticism of the ancient world, I could do a whole uh, show on this, but I'll just mention a few things. You know, you did have strongman type competitions. You do have like giant rocks that have inscriptions that would, you know, it was lifted by a certain person, you know, and at a certain time and or whatever. Some of it could be true. Some of it could be false, of course. But you do have record of, you know, heavy rock lifting competitions. And they're, they're not just like, how many rocks can you lift? That wouldn't be a strongman competition necessarily, like a strength training sort of athleticism. Well, it would be, but it would be more like strength endurance. But we're talking about, for actual strength training, we're talking about one rep. We're talking about the heaviest weight you can lift one time. Like the heaviest weight you can lift, period. You know, and that has to do with actual strength, you know, the white uh, strength tissue, the white tissue, opposed to the red fast and slow twitch tissue. The white tissue doesn't have much endurance to it, but it, it's the strongest. So if you don't train with super, super, super heavy weights, then you won't go to top strength. Okay, so that's something that exists in, in modern, with modern strength and power lifters. Athleticism. So we also have rock throwing. We are records of any ancient world of rock throwing, of course. Stuff like uh, more technique and, you know, based movements like throwing the discus. Um, in the ancient Greek and Roman world, um, there, in terms of athleticism, there is mention of lifting weights of different barbells even. Um, there's reference to both bodybuilding and strength type training. But also endurance type training, you know, like the Romans were more into endurance type training. And they'd criticize 
um, basically the equivalent of Greek bodybuilders who would go to the public bathhouse, oil up, lift um, dumbbells, and grunt loudly, and get their muscles really big while their endurance really was horrible, and they had to take a nap every day, and they had to eat a lot. <laughs> And they were walked around. They were really tired all the time. And wrestle and Romans would criticize this and say the Roman, on the other hand, is basically lean and mean. <laughs> is lean and has great endurance. And um, you know, criticized the Greek bodybuilder. So there was a wide range of uh, in strength to strength endurance type straining training with athleticism there was heavy weights um there was also in sports leaping events so there's the equivalent of like modern plyometric train uh, plyometric training um might not exist in the great elite form it is today but there was some sort of you know emphasis on training your uh, high jump and long jump and uh, reference to swimming events you know so definitely some sports and power movements in there so um, when you really look at the opportunities for athleticism in the Greek world, sort of the spectrum in many ways is all there. So the spectrum in athleticism is this, all right? You have your cardio endurance, of course, which is, you know, running, your long-term running, which is, you know, and your short-term running. So you have cardio um, when you want to think of endurance, you have to think of both your lung capacity but also um, the energy storage and the way your muscles themselves use energy. So not only do you have to train muscle endurance, you have to train your lung endurance. And so um, there are different fibers, of course, in a muscle, and they all fatigue at different times based on different things. So you have to train, you can train, there are all these levels of, of athleticism you can have. And that spectrum in the ancient world is there as well as in the... Uh, modern world you might not see like you know weird stuff like uh, modern you know, like uh, lactic acid training where um, you flex all your muscles and you keep constant tension as you train to train lactic acid resistance so it's like fatigue resistance you might not have an equivalent of something like that in the ancient world but you, then again you might you know, like uh, uh, the Chinese, right? We have dynamic tension exercises you would see with traditional martial arts. And basically you stand there, and you've probably seen it. If you've ever seen a Kung Fu movie, you know, stand in a low horse stance and like flex all your muscles and breathe like a snake, right? And, you know, flex all your muscles and do these like double palm strikes forward and then down and then back and then to the side and... You know, it's almost like lactic acid tolerance training. It's just constantly flexing all muscles while you move. You also see it with uh, Gojuru Karate. You see that with their Sanchin Katas, you know, and other systems that use Sanchin Kata that do, they flex all their muscles while they're moving and they move really slow in their training. You know, lactic acid resistance, you know, they wouldn't necessarily say that, but I mean, you know, who knows what, who know, who knows why they do it. Um, you have things show up like that. You have the anomalies that are like, hey, that kind of has a modern equivalent. That's kind of like lactic acid training, you know. Um, but you know, we don't we don't always have that information. But the broad spectrum is there. It's possible that you could have someone as a athletic as someone who is a pro athlete. Maybe I don't know. It's possible. It's possible, I suppose. Um, but with the steroid issue, of course, I don't know. I don't know if there is an equivalent in the ancient world to steroids. Um, probably not. Probably not. But also, the thing about unique training methods. I mean, the Greeks, because, you know, there's a lot of war going on. There were a lot of armed combat. It was still like, you know, either you're in a phalanx, you're fighting many people at a time, a lot of times you're still kind of fighting one person, you know, when in actual military training. So there are all these, this category I would call unique training methods. You have these training methods and, um, you know, military systems that you might have an edge over someone who's modern who might not be adept at certain things. You know, there's this big question mark, like... It's almost like unmentioned combat styles, you know, unique training methods. Like, what training methods existed that we don't know about, you know? And that also kind of adds to our athleticism category. We know the broad spectrum was there, but how much of it and, you know, how unique was it and 
what did they have that maybe we don't have, you know? Um, maybe they had this amazing vertical jump we don't know about, you know? <laughs> it's hard to say. And, of course, talking about uh, you know, steroids and uh, modern strength enhancement supplements, um, there is reference to, you know, um, the idea of the bodybuilder to keep the big muscles, to get the big muscles, had to eat large amounts of meat. I'm going to talk about this later. I'm probably going to write a book that compares um, modern and ancient um, movement systems and athleticism. Um, but the... Um, Modern, uh, the ancient bodybuilders mentioned to eat large amounts of meat and uh, recommended uh, sleeping a lot. And what's interesting is uh, when you read books on bodybuilding or what have you, it's often recommended to get a nap in the middle of the day and to definitely get plenty of sleep. That's so important to keep your size, your muscle size, and growth, you know, for recovery at least, if anything. Um, the bodybuilder. Um, might not do super heavy squats. They uh, sometimes some of them do, uh, like the strength trainer or what have you. But the volume they get, they might lift a little bit lighter weights than a strength trainer, and they do you know more isolated movements like curls as well. They're actually putting their body through a high volume of movement and weight over time, and um, stimulating quite a bit of fatigue on many levels to get that size to get that muscle big. And of course, we can't forget the use of steroids, you know. Um, so, so let's really look at the differences, kind of sum up everything. I, you know, I kind of talked about, I compared them as I went, but let's sum up some of the uh, differences and, and then we can wrap it up. Um, here's some of the big questions. Like, this is what I would want to know, is like, when I really compare like if we put if we if we put a match between the MMA fighter, the modern MMA fighter, and an ancient Greek combat sportsman who's well rounded, if we really put them together, what would be the questions that that I wanted to know after having investigated this material? Like you can do boxing, wrestling, you know, you look at the athleticism of the ancient world that's available, and um, and that sort of thing. So the question I would have is, what are the decent submissions in ancient Greece? Like, did they have decent submissions at all? You know, if they didn't, then that's a big problem. You know, if you have to be able to go to the ground and submit the opponent with a choke or an arm bar or something, or a leg submission so the person taps out or something breaks or they pass out. Or otherwise, you know, you won't win on the ground. <laughs> Maybe you can ground and pound, which is to sit on the person and punch them and but, you know, uh, if, if you don't have submissions on the ground, you know, there's a big hole in your game. So the question is, did they have it in, say, ancient Greece or ancient Rome? Did they have any s decent submissions? And I would say, well, gosh, you know, they probably did have some, you know. Um, there are certainly fighters who knew about them. Um, you know, consider the rear naked choke and the one arm scissor lock. Um, you know, did they have those? You know, not that we know. Um, but we know from wrestling, they had stuff like arm cranks and the guillotine, but that's probably mainly positional stuff, right? You, you kind of control someone's position and so you can pin them. It's not so you could get them to tap out, you know? Um, but look, what if there was a niche gladiatorial type of combat? You know, when we talk about gladiatorial combat, we're mainly talking about weapon-based systems. So that's why I haven't been talking about gladiators. But then again, you know, gladiatorial combat was not just big stage stuff. It was also private stuff, too. You could watch gla people fight to the death, you know. And if you were rich, especially, you know, um, you could do that sort of thing with gladiatorial culture in Rome. Okay, so we say gladiatorial combat's mainly weapon-based. But wait a minute. Is it possible that there were gladiatorial matches that were unarmed? <laughs> Think about that for a minute. If there were... Well, then, it's like modern MMA, right? Because one would have to win in unarmed gladiatorial combat in the ancient world, okay? With the, with the presupposition that one of them would have to win, how do you win? Well, <laughs> you can win by knocking the person out. Okay, so there's your boxing skills. Or you can win by choking the person. Okay, so that's wrestling and some Brazilian jiu-jitsu, maybe. 
And that usually happens on the ground. Look, most fighting, even traditional martial artists kind of knew this. You know, most real fights end up on the ground. We knew this before the UFC came around, just weren't good at it. <laughs> um, but, most, you know, unarmed combat, you're going to end up on the ground usually. You know, you can knock the person out. But if you need to end the person or kill them, then you're going to keep hitting them until they're non-responsive or, you know, um, or in some cases, if you're a lightweight, you know, hitting them might not be enough, especially if you break your hand and you're like, oh, I can't hit them anymore. And that's, that's not an uncommon problem with street fighters. You know, they're great at MMA. They wrap their hands, they put gloves on it. But once you fight in a real fight with a fist and you don't know how to hit, or even if you do know how to hit, it hit, and so oftentimes you get a bad angle, you'll break your hand, you'll break your fist. Unarmed combat's not the way to go, really. But um, we got to keep in mind that there's possibly an unarmed gladiatorial combat convention that perhaps is overlooked that was maybe bigger than w w what we know. Um, and if that's the case, then you had to have submissions, right? You had to have chokeouts, at least. Maybe you didn't have the, um, the scissor arm bar, you know, <laughs> but you certainly had something equivalent to a rear naked choke. So, you know, there's half the submission game there, you know, from what I understand about it. Guillotines, of course, are so natural that, of course, those exist, you know, the guillotines that choke where the opponent's been over and you have their head basically through one arm and you're choking them upward usually. That's natural and that people go into that naturally. When the person's head's down, they wrap their arm around it and choke their neck. You know, that's you don't have to learn that. You just do it naturally. Um, so, yeah, um, that's that's a big elephant in the room. So let's look at boxing. And the big question there is, you know, how elite and developed was ancient boxing? Perhaps it was highly developed for an unknown time. It's difficult to know, you know. But keep in mind, not all champion MMA fighters have elite boxing skills either. <laughs> so if you really want to compare an ancient um, combat sportsman versus a modern MMA fighter, keep that in mind. You might actually have some pretty good matches going on there. <laughs> and let's look at another one. Let's look at kicking systems. This one stands out to me. Um, from, you know, ancient pottery, frescoes, ancient stuff, you know, kicking didn't seem to be a part of the combat sports in the ancient world in a major way. And like I said before, hey, maybe it did. Maybe it just never became a sort of mainstream, what we'd call a mainstream Olympic sport. Maybe in an Argos or Spartan, Sparta, you know, that's something you practice when you were a youth, you know, flipping, kicking, parkour, capoeira-like systems, you know. And that maybe more Greeks than what we knew could do high kicks and wheel kicks and spinning kicks and flip kicks and cartwheel kicks and, you know, stuff like that. Never know. Uh, it's likely that somewhere at some point, you know, they were there was a game or whatever that had a kick to it, you know. Um, you know, not all martial artists before the UFC and martial artists in the UFC are that big into high kicks anyway. You know, they might do a little low kicks, but, you know, not all modern, modern fighters use them. It's kind of a specialty, isn't it? Uh, and so there are a lot of different things to think about here. The reality of combat is that combat is different than sports combat, but it overlaps, of course, in many ways, right? So Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu comes in in the sports combat scene, and they dominate everyone. And they say, well, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is superior and, you know, at least has its place, you know, in the combat realm. Um, but the reality of combat is that unarmed combat itself, in many ways, is sort of the least preferred category of fighting when it comes to real life death combat you know it's to many people uh, even alexander the great um he's he he said to that that different sports different things that people practice should be more with weapons and that like boxing and wrestling and that sort of thing don't prepare someone for war um they're great for show and to show prowess but it's when you train, you know, the spear, <laughs> you know, and the sword and the shield <clears throat> that you're really killing people and not being killed, opposed to struggling with someone to show victory through your strength and technique, you know, one on one. So, 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 so keep in mind, this is combat, unarmed combat sports. It's not necessarily, 
you know, um, weapon fighting at all. Um, so yeah, leave your comments below. It looks like there's a, some really interesting comparison points there, you know, especially with boxing and wrestling really overlap nicely. Uh, kicking um, is a big question mark with the ancient world and also submissions, like what kind of submissions they had. We, we know they had some, but you know, were they as technical as the Brazilians? Well, eh, probably not, probably not. Um, unless there was some sort of you know, long-term unarmed combat that didn't always, you know, result in, you know, I don't know, death or something like that. And, of course, Muay Thai is unique. Uh, judo is unique. It's hard. Maybe some of those systems did, you know, stuff like that did exist. We just don't know about it, you know. Judo-like throws in ancient Greece. But we also we looked at athleticism, um, scientific explosive strength, raw strength, uh, strength endurance, also cardio, you know. Um, we do see... That there was a broad amount of athleticism, but how far did they take it? Did they take it as far as modern science has taken strength and explosive strength training? Also, uh, strength enhancement supplements and steroids. Probably not an equivalent in the Greek world. We knew they understood the idea of eating and resting in the Greek world, which is super, super important for athletes. Um, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so there's a, some of the big topics there, um, some interesting points to consider. So please leave your comments below and thank you for tuning in to Ancient Light. Ancient Light.